Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is CPAWS's Celebrating Local Climate Solutions event, and this is the Lethbridge edition. Um, so we've been hosting these events all week to celebrate climate solutions across Southern Alberta in partnership with NSERC Science Odyssey Week. And we do have the chat open if you want to pop in the chat where you're calling in from and what brought you here, that would be great. It's great to see everyone online. Um, we can get started now. So Kira, can you move to the next slide, please? Okay, so before we begin, I think that as a conservation organization and someone who cares very deeply about the landscapes of Southern Alberta, for us to take a moment to reflect on the lands that I think a lot of us are calling in from tonight and the original stewards of this landscape. So I apologize, I do need to read the land acknowledgement. I haven't quite memorized it yet and I wanna ensure that I don't forget anybody. So CPAW Southern Alberta acknowledges that we work in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Kainai, Pekani, and Amskapi Pekani First Nations. The Sutina First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations, the Chinaha Nation, and the Métis Nation of Alberta. And of course, today, Southern Alberta is home to Indigenous people from all over North America. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for taking a moment to reflect on, on the stewards of this land. Uh, next slide, please, sir. I apologize too, if you guys can hear the dogs barking in the background, I'm so sorry. Um, so a little bit about CPAWS. We are the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. Uh, we're a nationwide nonprofit working to protect parks and public lands across Canada. Uh, our chapter in Southern Alberta was born in 1967 out of development pressures in Banff. And we have since led conservation efforts from Banff to Kananaskis down into the castle. And we also have an environmental education team who offers award-winning programming and you will hear more about that tonight. Um, so this event is part of Science Odyssey. So NSERC has put this on and it goes on until so May 16th, so it is Canada's largest celebration of science and STEM across the country. And there are lots of great events going on. The website is on the PowerPoint if you wanted to check it out. Uh, we're hosting three regional events. So Monday, we were talking about Calgary. Tonight, we're talking about Lethbridge. And tomorrow will be Medicine Hat. And we've got awesome speakers from all of these regions ready to speak to you guys. Next slide. Thanks. Uh, and of course, everyone who registered on Zoom has been entered to win a climate prize pack. So it's got a climate kit in it that includes at-home actions that you can take for climate change, as well as some awesome CPAWS swag. So the organization of tonight is we've got five panelists set up. Each panelist will have about 10 minutes to present and then depending on how we're doing for timing, we should have time for one or two questions between presentations. And then afterwards, we'll have about 30 minutes for a full panel discussion at the end. Um, so the speakers for tonight are Catherine DeLucia from the Climate Hub of Southern Alberta, Abhi Sumaka, Laura Williams Singer III from Kainai Nation, Kainai Ecosystem Protection Association and Old Man Watershed Council. And we have Sheldon Atwood from Western Ranchlands Corporation, Paige Rossner from Helen Schuler Nature Center, and Sabrina Ryans from CPOS Southern Alberta. So the guiding question, our overall theme of tonight is, what do you see as being the most promising climate solution in Southwest Alberta or the Lethbridge area? And of course, we're not saying that there's any one solution or one is better than the other. It's just, we've got a broad range of perspectives on the panel tonight, so it'll make for some interesting discussion later on. So we will just jump right into it. So a little bit of Zoom etiquette, I guess, before we get started. Um, I know that everyone is probably Zoomed out by now, but <laughs> uh, just in case, we've got, so you've got the chat bottom, chat button at the bottom. Um, a lot of people have already, have already started using that, which is great. There's the raise hand option, which if you use that, I can unmute you and you can ask your question verbally. And then there's the Q&A function. So that'll bring up a box that everyone's questions will pop up into. 
and you can actually upvote the question. So if someone else asks one similar to yours, you can vote on it and then it'll bring it to the top. So if we have a lot of questions between panelists, I'll probably choose the one that has the most votes on it. Um, yeah, and please ask your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, if you ask it in the chat, it might get lost within the chat and then I won't see it. So, so please use the Q&A or the raise hand. So our first speaker tonight is Catherine DeLucia from the Climate Hub of Southern Alberta. So Catherine is a third year undergraduate student at the University of Lethbridge, working on a BA in Women and Gender Studies. She's the Executive Administrator with the Climate Hub of Southern Alberta. She's currently a research assistant studying ecological grief and focuses on justice-based approaches to climate action. Take it away, Catherine. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so did a wonderful job of introducing me. Usually I have to do it myself. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you today about um, what we're calling climate solution synergies, uh, two kind of climate solutions that actually we feel work really well together at the Climate Hub um, and that we are currently advocating for in Southern Alberta and the Southern Prairies in general. Um, next slide. So just a quick, a quick little uh, pitch about the Climate Hub of Southern Alberta. Uh, we're a grassroots organization focused on climate sustainability. Um, we seek to promote education and community action on the issues of climate change and climate justice, um, and especially all of the varied impacts of climate change and the benefits of implementing renewable energy and sustainable practices. Um, and our board currently, currently consists, wow, can't talk today, of uh, Dr. James Byrne, uh, Sydney Whiting, myself, and, and a number of other community members, students, university faculty, and climate activists. Next slide. So um, just before I launch into our solutions, just my little spot about climate justice um, and that climate solutions without climate justice frameworks, and that is acknowledging the disproportionate impact of climate change and the um, events that catalyze climate change on marginalized people. Um, it perpetuates settler colonialism and continues the disposition of indigenous peoples and communities. Um, indigenous people have acted and continue to act as stewards of land, as Brooke was talking about earlier. And climate solutions must include meaningful consultation um, with indigenous communities and also include perspectives and knowledge, um, not just listening and then taking out what we want to hear and acting regardless, um, but meaningfully engaging and um, considering their perspectives. Uh, next slide. So the name of the game is, oh, sorry, there we go. Okay, uh, name of the game is sustainability. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, the human exploitation of the planet is just unsustainable as we're currently progressing. <laughs> um, climate solutions need to reduce greenhouse gases beyond just reduction, but actually implementing renewable energy sources that have a minimal greenhouse gas production. Um, and greater move, and also it can be accompanied by greater moves to sustainable food production, which benefit from renewable energy resources, as well as limiting the carbon footprint that's required to produce and transport food. In Alberta, we think there's a really strong potential for solar and wind, as well as solar battery, and a smaller potential, but still acknowledgeable for biothermal energy and geothermal energy. Um, and this also extends to increasing local food production via greenhouses. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, next slide. Okay. So the first part of our synergy system is the renewable energy corridor. Um, as I was saying before, between the wide open prairies and the constant winds, Southern Alberta has a strong potential for solar and wind energy production. Um, this investment will not only um, achieve the main goal of limiting greenhouse gas emissions and improving air quality, but it'll also create new and long-term jobs that don't, aren't impacted by the boom and bust of fossil fuels. And it also reduces the cost of energy production by making systems that are non-reliant on fossil fuels. And also it decentralizes the energy sector from concentrated extraction sites. And what I mean by that is more of a climate justice um, concept because a lot of the resource extraction in the name of fossil fuels is often accompanied by what's called man camps. Um, and these are sites that often contribute to a lot of the issues around missing and murdered indigenous women. So decentralizing the energy sector would potentially counteract this problem, although there is a much bigger issue of misogyny in our culture, but I won't get into that today. Um, next slide. So why must Alberta act now? I think this graph kind of really paints the picture um, and you probably can't see the bottom, but that scary bar that has the highest peak 
and is seemingly going up, that's Alberta, in comparison to all the other provinces in Canada. We're currently producing the most, most greenhouse gases and showing no sign of slowing down. Um, and the fact is most of the provinces have minimal and if they, the ones that do have significant are either increasing or slowly or decreasing rather or slowly increasing compared to these leaps and bounds that we've seen here. So it's a really key point that Alberta act on this and reduce our fossil fuel consumption and production. Next slide. Um, so the way forward for in our opinion is the um, employment of municipal power purchase agreements. These are essentially just long-term agreements between energy purchasers and energy producers. Um, it ensures that there will be revenue streams to fund energy projects, and in this case, solar, wind, and other sustainable systems. Um, green, energy, green energy investments can be used by a number of different agencies and businesses, and as I've mentioned before, it will create new jobs, um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and impact regional air quality. And especially within Southern Alberta, we have the uh, smoke season in the summer. Air quality is always an issue and contributing more is um, something that we need to consider. Next slide. And the last piece of our energy corridor would be to um, connect Alberta and British Columbia because the big, the age old question against solar and wind is always, what do we do when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? Um, by increasing the east-west electrical connectivity grid, it would allow more power to flow between Alberta and BC. And this has a much lower price tag and a much, or a greatly increased environmental impact than building a pipeline. It would connect, connect the renewable energy sources in Southern Alberta to the existing hydroelectricity in British Columbia essentially creating stable and sustainable and low impact energy for Canada, or at least very least Western Canada. Um, next slide. Okay, so this is the second part and it kind of ties into the first would be the food production corridor. Um, to keep it short, Canadians spend a lot of money to Im import produce and most of it is grown in the American Southwest as well as Mexico and Central and South America. Um, this food production relies on unregulated unreg and undocumented workers, which exploits vulnerable populations of migratory workers, which is a justice issue, but it also has a massive carbon footprint for transporting all that fresh produce. Expanding greenhouse production in our province would, uh, by accompanying modern green, green energy, sorry, and hydroponics technology with renewable energy systems, um, would allow the Southern Prairies to be a major producer of food and also ensuring local food security. An example of this is the Holy Greenhouse in Coaldale. They produce millions of heads of lettuce a day, or not a day, rather, that'd be amazing, a year. Um, and we have that potential to expand that to other produce and make a greater sustainable um, produce market in Canada. Next slide. And as I was mentioning food security, um, the American Southwest is only getting warmer and drier thanks to climate change. The Colorado River is way overtaxed and is currently drying up because it's feeding seven states and parts of Mexico. Um, this is going to lead to a major loss of ag agricultural production in that region. And that is going to create a void that the Southern Prairies can fill. Using our existing irrigation, irrigation systems and renewable energy, the Southern Prairies can become a major food producer while also decreasing the cost of food production for Canadian, or food acquisition for Canadians. Um, and I believe last slide, yes. So just a last little pitch. Um, so the Climate Hub actually has a very strong relationship with the University of Lethbridge and uh, a lot of our board members and our research partners are either students or faculty members at that university and they're doing amazing work on climate change in terms of climate solutions and tracking climate events. Um, and one such example is biothermal energy. Um, it's the energy that is produced by using the thermal reaction that is created by decomposing organic matter to create power. Um, this would essentially take cow manure and, fund and fuel the farm that helps that cow make that manure. <laughs> it's a pretty interesting circle. Um, it's still an ongoing bit of research, but if we could potentially power our agricultural endeavors by using the waste from our agriculture business, that would be amazing. So there's a strong potential for allying between climate action and research. And uh, that's everything I have. Thank you for listening and thank you for having me. Thanks, Catherine. I, oh, we've got a question popped up into the Q&A here. Um, so it is, what are some key barriers that are currently preventing these solutions from being implemented? And what work is or could be done to tackle those barriers? I would say the biggest barrier is the initial investment um, because there does need to be some sort of investment to get these type of systems set up. They end up paying for themselves because they don't require the same constant input of fuel, but that initial investment does create a lot of barriers for municipalities to commit. 
um, to engaging in PPAs. Um, and as for the greenhouse issue, they're, it, without the sustainable energy with current power costs, they're not cost effective. So you won't see them as much in this region. But if we are able to overcome that initial investment and get folks excited about green energy, then we really have the potential to do a lot more agricultural um, action with less um, energy costs. Thanks. And we have one more question, and I'm just going to add on to it a little bit. So the question is, what can regular people do day to day to help? And I'm going to add on to that and ask, how can people get involved with the Climate Hub of Southern Alberta? That is a great question. I mean, day to day, it's you'll see a lot of uh, advertising to, you know, uh, carpool and uh, recycle. And those are important, but it's also important to consider um, how or who is actually responsible for a lot of the carbon emissions. And it's not you or I, it's big businesses and the um, governments that allow big businesses to continue. So day to day, it's um, writing your MLA that you want to see more green initiatives in your region, considering uh, when you're voting in the municipal elections, uh, who is the best candidate that's going to represent your city and promote a greener and more environmentally conscious city. Um, and to get involved with the Climate Hub, um, we actually have, if you go to our Facebook page, we have a sign up sheet that you can get on our mailing list. Um, and we'll get in contact with you and see if you're interested in being involved. Uh, right now, we're working on a few different projects and research um, projects as well. So we're more than happy to take community help however it presents itself. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. We will move on to our next speaker of the evening. So our next speaker is Abhi Sumaka or William Singer III. So named after his great, great uncle, Running Coyote, who was a Blackfoot warrior, he carries on his legacy by surviving in two worlds and maintaining the Blackfoot worldview. His main profession is as an artist illustrator with 40 years of experience. His work is deeply rooted in the Blackfoot worldview and uses painting to teach. Along with his art, he devotes a lot of time being an entrepreneur and an environmental and political activist, ut utilizing Blackfoot ecological knowledge and protocol. Other areas of interest include food security and sovereignty, Blackfoot science and physics, watershed health, and grassland restoration. Happy Sumaka has been involved in many spiritual, cultural events and activities and has always been an advocate for First Nations rights, knowledge, and wellness. He currently operates Nappy's Garden and Katoya Seed Bank and is a member of Kainai Ecosystem Protection Association and the Old Man Watershed Council. Take it away. Okay, uh, thank you for, um, uh, it's an honor to speak to with you all this evening and I'd like to share the story of, uh, of uh, my reserve and so what we're going through right now is uh, climate change and adaptation and that's something that Blackfoot ha have always been doing is uh, adapting. And it's also to uh, talk about the work of the Kane Ecosystem Protection Association. Next slide. So this is a map of the reserve. At the top, you'll see a green line. It says 1995. And that was the extent of our harvest uh, at that time. So when you move down to the middle, you'll see the extent of harvest in 2006. You see the line moving down south near standoff. And in 2019, the line moved further south and that's actually right at the doorstep of my house. So what's happening right now is a lot of the plants that we rely on uh, for ceremony and food are, are, in the, are in decline. And a lot of the plants you start are, are starting to, um, you can only find them on the Southwest part of the reserve. And that's why we're doing this work that we're, gonna, we're doing right now. Next slide. So the, the first, the reason I got into this was the decline of sweetgrass. Sibutsumo, and it, the Blackfoot uh, um, means fragrant smell. And th the reason, you know, the work became really important is sweetgrass is a very uh, important plant to the tribe and to Blackfoot peoples, because it's our connection to, you know, the spirit world. It's, a, it's the foundation of a lot of our prayers. Uh, we use it into, uh, for smudging, and also it's a, a medicine and also a food. So once I, you know, realized that the decline of this indigenous plant is a keystone species because once it's, it began its decline, then uh, sage started to disappear. And from there, wild mint. So it's just like a domino effect. Next slide. So one of the interesting things that we've been encountering for quite a number of years is uh, invasive species and, and a lot of drought. So, and a lot of that really affects our wetlands and wild grasslands. 
So this is uh, my, my home and you look south, you can see the yellow patches and that's a uh, leafy spurge. And the thick patch down where that little shrub is, that's where uh, the sweet grass fields are. So uh, last year, uh, in 2019, the sweet grass patch was actually, it pretty well disappeared. So we're, we began to look at um, other efforts into saving them. So uh, working with the blood tribe land management, we partnered to find ways to, uh, you know, to stop in, in to, I guess, to further our, our research. Next study, next slide. <clears throat> So one of the things that um, the blood tribe land management uh, wants the tribe to do is to be uh, to have involvement, especially with the community. So I myself, I took it upon myself to see what I can do. So this is a cultivated field, and I live right. I live near a water body, and you can see how close it is to the uh, uh, water body. So one of the things that I decided to do is to start re uh, repairing these riparian areas and areas and stopping herbicides and fertilizers from entering the water bodies. Next slide. So within that same area, I moved the cultivation line quite a bit. So you can see it's further away from the, the water body and all of this area that's, uh, that's um, not, uh, we're actually gonna be reintroducing native grass and other plant species and possibly some shrubs to, uh, to stop the you know further uh, herbicides and fertilizers from entering the water body. So with that, this is actually the fourth year I've been doing this. And so once once one thing I noticed is that it's it's created you know more animal habitat. And with the indi indigenous plant reintroduction, a lot of plants are coming back, uh, taking their place. And it also gives uh, you know um, an opportunity for you know the land to heal itself. Next slide. So one of the beginnings of uh, the this pro project was uh, I, I did some work at Dakana High School greenhouse in 2019. 40 years ago, this greenhouse was built when I was a residential school student there. 40 years ago, I was uh, planting carrots, uh, celery, uh, tomatoes in this particular greenhouse. And 40 years later, we're actually uh, growing all of our indigenous plant species like sweetgrass, uh, wild, um, Wild onions. Uh, we know we're trying to. We're working on, on wild turnips and yarrow, and, and the list goes on. Wild strawberries. Next slide. So this is the test bed that we have in there, and this year it's actually increased. Uh, so the things that we realized is that you know we have to do something, and one of the things that we you know we we agreed on is to start reintroducing species and um, also to begin the development of a seed bank. Next slide. So a lot of this is all really new to the tribe. And this is something that we never really had to encounter or I guess to really think of until uh, I stumbled on the, the, the sweet grass issue, you know, a bit declining. So um, with the uh, assistance of elders and community members and blood tribe land management, and the Old Man Watershed Council, I started Gutnapi's Garden and Gutnapi's Seed Bank back in 2020. So what you see here are just some test beds of uh, various plants that we, we would like to preserve and reintroduce back into the wild. And you can see uh, to the left is a, a raised bed of uh, wild, wild native grasses. And just behind my dog there, it's a, a garden bed of sweet grass. And further behind, beyond that is a, a, a bed of um, bush beans, and uh, you know hybrid vegetables, and in the foreground, the tall the tall garden box is a bed of uh, wild turnips or Indian breadroot, and uh, then we have the wild uh, actually the um, tobacco. So one of the things that uh, Blackfoot uh, um, cultivated was tobacco. We were never an agricultural people, so now we're moving into that area. Next slide. So in one, so realizing that we need to start expanding our operations, a you know through a, a grant through Oman Watershed Council, I purchased a uh, a seed can, and that's going to be uh, converted into a future seed storage facility compared to the equipment storage shed that we have. So a lot of this work is uh, is being invested in with a lot of different organizations that surround the reserve. Next slide. 
So with Napi's garden, a greenhouse is going to be built. So we had a groundbreaking ceremony back in October 2020. And that's myself and Derek Melton Tower, who's instrumental in the delivery of the greenhouse. Uh, I'm working closely with, he works with an organization called Secure Your Food. And that's my brother, Van Singer, and Blood Tribe Counselor, Maria Russell was there to assist us. And this is something I really like to see our leadership take part uh, in, our, uh, in our work that we do. Next slide. So this is a seed bank. These three boxes hold uh, roughly about 40 different varieties of seeds. And this year, we're really uh, proud to introduce sweet grass seeds and wild, in, wild turnip seeds or Indian breadroot seeds. And those particular plants, the two are the ones that we're working on right now to propagate and to reintroduce. Uh, so with the turnip seeds, one of the interesting things that we found out uh, that um, is uh, we've collected over 200 seeds but we noticed something that there's um, something is actually eating the seeds. So there's a bunch of little holes in them. And so the Lethbridge Research Station are actually working with us. And uh, that was, they were the ones that who let us know about, about this issue. So that's something else that we were actually gonna take uh, into account because this is my second year uh, in propagating them. So which means is that uh, we need to figure out what's eating these seeds. Next slide. So like I said, this is all new to the tribe. Uh, we never really dealt with seeds other than uh, some of them were used in some of our ceremonies. A lot of them were used as food. So now that you know, we have to start collecting our seeds, I approached the elders and suggested you know, what plants they wanted. So we started off with uh, the prairie parsley, three flowered avens and arrow leaf balsam root. All of these particular plants are medicine and food for our tribe. So, you know, the, the community and especially the elders are the ones that are, you know, are behind this and uh, we ask them what decisions that we have and if there's any suggestions they want. So it's all driven by the elders' suggestions. Next slide. So one of the things that um, were asked by the elders and the, uh, our, our, our societies and ceremonial people on the reserve was the decline in uh, willow. So we took it upon ourselves to train ourselves, like uh, can, I work with Kenzie Fox and Elvin First Rider. They did some training with Old Man Watershed and willow transplanting. So we, we had an opportunity to do that this past uh, March. So we're transplanting some willow that we harvested uh, earlier in, uh, in December. So a lot of the work that we do involves uh, uh, like wetlands and water quality testing, bird surveys and habitat, grassland restoration and reclamation, fire and renewal, INI, uh, the Buffalo, which is our keystone, a community garden project and education, partnerships, training, and education. Next slide. So this is a picture, you know, uh, I painted for uh, Helen Schuler. Uh, I believe it was 2017, they had an art show. And this is a painting called Invaders. So you can see all the traditional plants, they look like beadwork. And you see the dark stringy plants that are rising above them. Those are the invaders, the invasive species. But once I finished this picture and I brought it home, it felt like it was missing something. Next slide. And what was missing was the ini or the buffalo, because the buffalo are very you know, important in you know, repairing the landscape. And just this past February, we brought, uh, um, I believe it was, I think, 20 head of uh, bison back to the reserve. And the name of this uh, artwork changed, the painting is now called, and you will know us by the trail of the buffalo. Next slide. So the return of the ini, the buffalo, is very important because that basically uh, kind of closes, you know, everything that adds the last piece to this puzzle. And what we're going to you know, utilize the ini for is that they're going to help us in repairing our, our grasslands, either through grazing, through their dung, and just their overall action, they have positive effects to the landscape. Next slide. So that was when Napi, uh, Napi's garden and Gatuya Seed Bank came into being because the thing that uh, uh, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna also be working with the Inni who will be growing their food. And uh, they'll also be working with us, the Inni, to help us you know, heal the land. And, this, uh, and, and it's actually the home of the Kainai Ecosystem Protection Association. Next slide. So the reason you know uh, I, I chose the title is Napi was a was our trickster. 
And Nappi did a lot of, you know, uh, with his stories, he changed a lot of the uh, territory, either environmentally, he changed some weather patterns, even geographic. So when Nappi left the world and he was, uh, when he was gone, the, the landscape wasn't safe for anybody. So Katuyas, which is blood, uh, blood clot in Blackfoot, he was one of our troop, it was our Blackfoot heroes and it was a steward of the land. And he himself and his, and Sisum, his puppy, they, 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 they roamed the Blackfoot territory and they made the whole area safe for them. But that didn't end there because we're actually doing the work of him. So when he, once he passed into this world, he, he currently resides at the Katuya Six or the Sweet Pine Hills or Sweet Grass Hills. Next slide. So the future of this, uh, our project is, like I said, this is all new for our tribe. And at the same time, we need to start educating our younger generation. So these are my, grand, my grandkids. And you can see my grandson, Ryland, he's holding a dried turnip plant. And within that plant are seeds. So this is what they're learning as well, because we need to start you know, educating our younger generation on what they have to do for their future. Because a lot of this work that we're doing is actually for them, our future generations. But that also extends onto our surrounding communities. Next slide. So there's a lot of collaborations, and one of the main, you know, focuses is our community. So I do a lot of uh, work with the Blood Tribe Land Management, Old Man Watershed Council, Blackfoot Confederacy, the Helen Schuler Resilience Institute, Yukon to Yellowstone Conservation, the Ine Rematriation, Parks Canada, Galt Museum and Archives, the University of Lethbridge, the Lethbridge College, the Book Austin Early Intervention Society, Kaina High School, Red Crow Community College, R.I. Baker School, and the Kaina Food, Food Co-op. And currently in discussion with the Kaina Board of Education Schools, Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, University of Guelph, and the RL Food Institute, University of Waterloo, and the Lethbridge Interfaith Food Bank. Next slide. So this is a picture of my Nitomita, uh, Zoro, my dog. He's a uh, call him the warrior dog. And he was my partner throughout all of the work I've been doing. And he recently passed away uh, during the Easter holidays. And I wanted to remember him, you know, because of the work he did. You know, he was actually quite smart. He was able to sniff out certain plants and he, he knew what I was looking for. And he was also there to sort of save me in case there was uh, snakes or something that would harm me. And so he's surrounded by our, our you know, our, uh, the, you know, our, well, the people that we work, you know, that work with us, Old Man Watershed and the Blackfoot Confederacy, Blood Tribe Land Management, Yukon to Yellowstone and Superior Food. Next slide. In the end, this too, and that's how it is. Be wise and persevere. And thank you for listening to our story, because like I said, this is all, you know, really new for the tribe. And, you know, being that we're such a small group of people, we're always looking at the community to become involved. The more people we become that get involved, the more work that we can accomplish. And, and that includes the work that we're doing here in the talks that we're giving tonight. And I thank you all for listening to me. Thank you and have a good evening. So if you want to uh, reach out, there's some addresses here. You can, uh, we have a website and we have a Facebook page and also a Instagram page, Nappi's Garden. Uh, so if you want to see the work that we're doing, uh, please check out these sites. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Your photos are beautiful. I'm so, so sorry to hear about Zorro. I, my heart <laughs> is hurting for you to hear that. And I, when you said that he protected you from snakes, I'm looking at my dog laying beside me thinking, there's no way this dog would protect me from anything. <laughs> Um, so if people have questions, please pop them into the Q&A. Um, but in the meantime, I do have a question for you. I, and you kind of touched on it. I'm wondering, yeah, how people can get more involved with KIPA. Uh, and if you have a KIPA summit coming up this year, or if that's put on hold until the world is back to normal a little bit more. Um, actually, we're, we're going to be meeting on uh, this, you know, what we're going to do for a summit. And I think we're going to have it sometime in September. I'm not too sure. But uh, we're always looking for volunteers. So uh, a good place to, you know, to check is our Facebook page and it's updated regularly. Uh, we always have these, uh, um, you know, these uh, pro projects that we need volunteers for, but 
one of the things that kind of hold us back is this, this, the pandemic and the amount of people we can have. But we're always looking, you know, uh, other ways, like we can have a small group of people. Um, like I'm always looking for volunteers to assist me here out at Nafi's Garden. Our Facebook page is a good place. Awesome, and I think Jacqueline, yeah, Jacqueline pasted the link into the chat. So we do have time for one more question. Um, so I'm just gonna go with the first one that came in. And it is, does Kainai hope to expand the seed bank to riparian and foothill plant species for the seed bank? Uh, yes, uh, that's what we're working with uh, Parks Canada. So one of the, uh, the goals that we, we realized that we're going to do is that we're going to uh, work in the area of uh, grassland restoration and reclamation. So we're actually going to be working with outside communities uh, once we start building up our inventory of seeds. So whatever is, needs to be uh, reintroduced, we're, we'll be getting those seeds. So we basically got most of the seeds, uh, the 40 varieties, the common ones, and we just need to grow that a bit more. So a lot of the seeds we use are actually being used for research purposes right now. But eventually we will be, uh, 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 you know, the reserve will be there to assist other communities off the reserve. Thank you. And as soon as I said I was going to ask one question, someone upvoted the, the other question in the box. So I'm just going to ask that one as well. Um, and the question is, how can members of other tribes contribute? Uh, well, either if they, you know, if they have seeds, because a lot of uh, this, some of the seeds that we use are pretty well spread out and they're common through a lot of different areas. Uh, if they do have seeds they want to share with, uh, they're welcome to, or if they want to partner with us in uh, whatever way however way they can, because we always, we always find a way to work with others. And one of the things that I'm doing is I'm turning my cultivated land back to grassland. So we're going to be having plots for certain you know, organizations to do test beds. So, and that's the other work that we're doing. Awesome, thank you so much. We will see you again in the panel discussion afterwards. Here I can, oh, thanks. <laughs> so our next presenter is Sheldon Atwood from Western Ranchlands Corporation. So raised in Southern Alberta, both of Sheldon's grandparents had large ranching properties. He received degrees in animal science and range science before completing a doctorate in natural resource management focused on integrating ecology, economics, and animal behavior. He began buying ranches in 2002 to, to, to demonstrate how private enterprise can create a more cost-effective conservation model. In his current role as president and CEO of Western Ranchlands Corporation, in addition to overseeing daily operations of the company's Tomahawk Ranch west of Edmonton, Sheldon pursues tangible solutions to climate change through large-scale ad adoption of regenerative grazing, innovations in rural renewable energy, enhancement of stagnant or overdense woodlots, and developing other carbon emission reducing projects. Sheldon, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, but first I wanted to thank William for that inspiring presentation of practical efforts to make real change in the world. I have uh, friends and family that grew up on the reservation, there, the blood reserve and uh, uh, between Lethbridge and Cardston and uh, appreciate the work that's being done and the note be wise and persevere the end of your speech with because that's so integral to these solutions that we're looking at relative to making the world a better place in whatever way it is, right? It takes time and it takes commitment and that kind of thing. And so my talk is just meant to touch on some of uh, the ways that those of us in the rural communities uh, agriculture particularly can contribute to uh, climate-based solutions across the board. And the uh, organizers of the uh, uh, the webinar here asked the, you know, what's the most promising solution to climate solutions? And I'd like to submit that uh, regenerative agriculture poses an enormous opportunity and William certainly talked about some practical forms of regenerative practices, bringing back native plant species and these kinds of things. And so there's a whole suite of practices that fall under this umbrella of regenerative agriculture. 
But in total, um, if we think about it, a, applied across all of Canada's arable lands, we could entirely wipe out the carbon footprint of the entire nation by converting our current agricultural system to a regenerative system. That's every condominium, every car, every coal fired power plant, everything could be offset and we'd be as a nation uh, net carbon negative. So that's certainly something worth being aware of in the magnitude of, of what we could do if everyone would adopt these kinds of practices. Um, go ahead to the first next slide. So tonight I was just gonna touch on some of the things that we do within Western uh, Ranchlands. Our company is essentially a group of producers and our friends that uh, we feel like a lot like a family farm, although instead of being united by blood, we're re related by an idea that sustainably managed land can be more profitable in the long run and can generate more wealth for people that invest and park their resources in sustainably stewarded uh, long-term land-based resources and uh, that we can use ecological principles and processes to optimize the returns from, from that land and generate healthy uh, habitat for wildlife, uh, healthy soils, healthy watersheds, clean water, uh, open space, uh, recreational opportunities. And in parallel perhaps with the vision and mission of CPAWS is provide companion lands that also provide a high level of ecological value in proximity to Canada's uh, parks and wilderness areas. Uh, both that allow overflow uh, opportunities for human impact, but also offer um, corridors for travel for different kinds of wildlife and those kind of things, all within the context of sequestering carbon in our soil profile and bringing the atmosphere into balance with the soil profile that, that's there. And so in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the regenerative grazing practices. Oh, sorry, this is an introduction to our ranch here west of Edmonton, where I focus most of my time. Go ahead to that next map slide. Um, it's just illustrating that here uh, on this property where I spend most of my time, uh, we're just under 15,000 acres or 90 quarters um, <clears throat> sandwiched between Lake Wobbeman and the North Saskatchewan River and uh, consist of uh, three main um, uh, ecological types. Uh, and each of those has different implications for uh, things that we can do relative to uh, sequestering carbon in, uh, in the soils and providing wildlife habitat, recreational value, and certainly uh, revenue from agricultural operations. So next slide. Okay, my assumption is that most of the people here on this webinar have some sense and understanding of the carbon cycle depicted in the picture on the, on the left at the bottom there and recognize that plants are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and putting that carbon into the soil in the form of roots. And in this diagram, it illustrates dead plants. What a lot of people don't realize though is that there's a lot of plasticity in the ways that animals utilize um, landscapes. And uh, William and the, and the uh, Native Americans that are bringing bison back into their systems, uh, that's bison and cattle in our mind are ecological analogs. And if they're managed in a similar kind of way, they can supercharge the natural processes of the ecosystem in order to suck more carbon out of the atmosphere and into the plant pro or into the soil profile. And really that's primarily done through uh, practice of pulse grazing, just like large herds of wild buffalo would have moved through and uh, evenly utilized large areas and then left the area for a period of time, allowing the grasses to rejuvenate. And, 
There's a lot of things structurally that happen uh, beneath the soil surface to allow those plants, their roots to die back and then be regrown later. Um, the balance of utilization by desirable and undesirable plants, the uh, matrix of nutrition or biochemical diversity then that uh, herded large groups of herded animals uh, experience as opposed to those that uh, are managed in uh, more conventional or colonial style small herds uh, with long duration grazings and more selectivity so that uh, they may not be balancing their diets as well uh, or they may be overutilizing certain plants and harming the environment or even causing uh, detrimental effects uh, such as uh, trailing or overutilization of preferred plants and that kind of thing. And in this process of regenerative grazing, um, it stimulates the plant growth. And it's a little bit like, a, like an iceberg. If you want to think of 10% of the total biomass value of a plant being above ground, and 90% of it actually being possible to the organic matter produced by that plant over its lifetime in the perennial uh, grassland systems being under the, the plant. But then it's a double, um, a double iceberg because the amount of carbon associated with the plant material itself is just a fraction of the overall. The soil exudates or the sugars that the plant can creates and puts into the soil profile that support the bacteria and fungi and stuff that grows beneath the soil surface is again an order of magnitude greater than the volume of material in the plants themselves. And when you couple that with all of the things like the, the worms and uh, other types of bugs and stuff that go in that soil profile, it's phenomenal the amount of carbon that can be sequestered inside the soil profile. And as a producer and agriculturalist, this is really, really exciting to me because not only do I get to work with mother nature to do cool stuff, but it, it grows more feed, not only for my cattle, but for the wildlife and other creatures, it grows a more diverse array of plants and uh, creates a more interesting uh, environmental system but it also creates more water holding capacity in the soil profile. And that in turn further allows more growth of plants and slower uh, delivery of water offsite downstream. And so there's less erosion, there's less um, turbidity in the water and uh, uh, water quality issues downstream. They've been able to demonstrate that um, dams and reservoirs downstream can uh, persist longer uh, in regeneratively grazed watersheds and therefore those really expensive infrastructure projects uh, get to persist for longer and uh, there's certainly huge uh, cost savings in those kinds of things. These types of systems also play a role in reducing wildfire, the incidence of wildfire because plants are green sooner and longer than they would be under other types of, uh, of systems. And so there's a lot of synergies and interaction that takes place here because they're regenerative grazing uh, practices and that kind of thing. And so a lot of what we do here at Western Ranchlands is implement those practices and show others how implementing them can not only make the world a better place, make the property more uh, environmentally friendly and robust, improve wildlife habitat, but also benefit the pocketbook of the people involved in, in those enterprises. Uh, okay, next slide. So one of the projects that we're doing here in the diagram on the left is <clears throat> I've installed a circulating water system that uses geothermal exchange principle to cycle water around the ranch. This covers about a 3000 acre area of the, the ranch. And in all of those remote sites depicted by the little green spots, 
I've got insulated water troughs that don't require external heat or electricity in order to keep them open year round for, for uh, the cattle. And so I can remove the cattle far from headquarters, far from power and uh, electricity and have them distributing manure out in those areas, having them have uh, ecological impacts on the vegetation in those areas that are targeted to the desired effects that we would like to see or that our partners in, our, in the wildlife enterprises would like to see. Um, Alberta Conservation Association is a good partner of ours. Alice Canada is a great partner of ours. And, uh, and so that habitat mindset um, certainly helps. The nutrient distribution really helps, but uh, it also allows me to maintain large groups of cattle anywhere around the ranch that I want. Um, and to be able to, to cycle that water essentially um, through a pipeline that in some places I can't put uh, deep enough, I can't afford to dig into the sandstone to bury it below the frost line here in central Alberta. So um, by cycling that water using a one and a half horsepower pump, uh, when it goes, when the pipe goes below the frost line, then the water is able to stay warmer and uh, keep from freezing because of the rotating motion of the water. And so it's a very, very low energy uh, system altogether. Now, we're also working with the University of, of Alberta Geothermal Group to evaluate and look at opportunities to uh, pair heat exchangers powered through uh, repurposed uh, oil and gas wells. We have uh, 19 abandoned oil and gas wells spread around the property so that they could not only uh, increase the water temperature in our livestock line, our livestock water line, which if you think about it, the temperature of water the cattle are drinking during the winter affects how much feed they need to consume to maintain their body temperature, right? So raising the water temperature in their water by even a few degrees has economic benefits to me as a producer and the amount of feed I need to buy to keep them warm throughout the winter. Um, but that same repurposing of these geothermal wells can allow me to heat my houses and shops, uh, potentially build greenhouses and produce other types of food in other types of ways. So we're really excited about that and, and well into uh, working on uh, various aspects of that. Um, solar biomimicry is another thing that we've been looking at and discussing with uh, some solar power producers and others um, to look at a conventional type of solar array but lifted above the height of cattle and spread out a little bit further apart. And the biological principle here is that the diffuse light, occasionally shaded grassland, as you see in this picture on the right, actually creates more forage. It, the grassland under here doesn't get scalded by the sun as much. It gets a little bit of temperature relief. And um, it, it's been shown in a variety of species. Um, and this is really from based on work that began in silvopasture, but it's also been demonstrated in corn crops and other types of things where these pastures underneath these solar arrays um, can produce more feed and better quality feed than they would in an open pasture with no shade uh, assistance at all. And so uh, that's really interesting and, and neat stuff to us that we can put power back into the grid without losing land to uh, uh, mechanical or, or uh, interference by the, the panels themselves. So that's an interesting thing that we're playing with. If you go ahead to the next slide. Well, I don't know why this one didn't quite turn out right, but uh, we're also actively in the midst of a project to use that same um, silva pasture process to convert areas like this one on the left that are over dense woodlots, areas that have been fire suppressed for hundreds of years 
they're so dense and over thick with uh, woody material that your dog won't go out into there. They're ecological deserts within a few hundred meters of the uh, edge of them. So wildlife will go into there a little bit as uh, cover and, and whatnot, but really they're too dense to penetrate even for woodpeckers or uh, elk or anything else. They'll use them around the edges, but in the middle, it's, it's kind of a, a dead zone. And uh, we're opening those areas up and this reduces the fire hazard created by these overdense woodlots, just basically tinder boxes ready to go up. They're, uh, they're not very active in terms of sequestering additional carbon in the soil. They're more like a static carbon reserve. And again, because they're a threat for, uh, for wildfire, which we've just had one here in the neighborhood in the last week or two, um, it's really beneficial to thin those areas, to create more habitat pockets within those areas, and then allow other species, whether they're wildlife or cattle or whatever else, to uh, participate in that ecosystem. And I guarantee they're a lot more aesthetic to look at, and they're a lot more fun to be in, uh, whatever your purpose is there. And then those systems, as shown on the right, become active carbon sequestration zones rather than mere reservoirs. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So a couple other things that we're doing here to uh, pursue carbon reducing activity is we're experimenting with grazing silage piles. So reducing fossil fuel use in that sense. Um, we've been in discussions with the Highvale mine next door, it's the largest uh, open pit coal mine in Canada. They're actively in the process of shutting down and needing to reclaim about 16,000 acres. And we feel that using high density livestock grazing, we can help reduce their fossil fuel use and the amount of dozer hours needed to re-sculpt and reclaim that mine area. And uh, that's been demonstrated in other places and other times. So they're very open to discussing and have been discussing with us a test project to uh, help them save millions of dollars in and carbon footprint in, in that reclamation process. Uh, we believe very, very strongly in the development of a true carbon market, which is based on measurement based metrics. In other words, paying people for the carbon they actually sequester, not forcing them into following some set of rules. Like if you do X, Y, and Z, we think uh, there'll be some kind of return in terms of carbon sequestered somewhere or whatever. It's actually making people responsible for the carbon that they do sequester and using technologies to reliably verify that carbon in the soil profile or in your standing reserve, and then be able to be liable for the volatilization of that carbon or not. And uh, we're well down the road in, in terms of uh, working with some voluntary uh, based uh, carbon purchasers um, in order to do that. Uh, our partners have been involved in studies that have been published showing one to three tons per acre of uh, carbon sequestration. Um, and so that maths out to a meaningful uh, revenue diversification for, for our operations and something that provides a meaningful incentive for landowners to change their practices, to convert um, marginal cropland into grazed land, to engage in more regenerative and, and holistic types of uh, uh, farming practices as well as grazing. Uh, it's not just a grazing based mindset, that's for sure. Um, and then we're playing with some ideas and some working with people on variations of ways they can contribute and participate in helping to reduce our cost of capital and sponsor these different projects in different ways. And uh, we've been very successful on some small scale projects like that and uh, real examples that uh, show a lot of promise for, uh, for down the road. So that's probably the bulk of my overview. Um, 
the next slide is just a pretty end of the story. So, well, there, there you go. Thank you. Thanks, Sheldon. That presentation was great. Um, we unfortunately don't have time for any questions, but we can get to lots in the in the panel discussion afterwards. So if people in the audience do have questions, please keep popping them into the Q&A and we will get to them. Um, thanks, Sheldon. I like the image of the, what did you say, cowboys combating climate change? I think that's yeah. great. <laughs> thanks, Sheldon. So our next speaker is Paige Rossner from Helen Schuler Nature Center. So Paige coordinates an inquiry-based immersive program called the Natural Leaders Project, which asks students, teachers, and city employees to learn about this place and how to be good stewards of our urban ecosystem within the grasslands. Throughout six to 12 sessions, which include field studies, guest speakers, and action projects, we connect to our ecosystem and look for ways to adapt to a changing world. Indeed, that is in fact what we do. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Paige. I am right from the uh, Helen Schiller Nature Center, and uh, I'm going to talk about the Natural Leaders Project. I'll spend the first little bit kind of explaining a little bit more about what it is, and then I'll spend the second part kind of positing a deep philosophical question to everybody um, that can hopefully kind of give you a little bit of hope in this wild and crazy time. Uh, so the Natural Leaders Project is like kind of a new program, although now it's been five years. So a new kind of program format that the Nature Center has undertaken. And it basically plops me into the classroom. Um, I work with basically like eight year olds through till 14 year olds. So it's kind of like that tween, early teen age, which is just so awesome to work with. Um, and I see them consistently all year round, you know, every three weeks or so throughout the school year. Um, and when a teacher signs up for this program, they kind of like pick a module or a focus because otherwise we could just talk forever about this place that we live in and all the different environmental aspects that impact our life here. Um, but so we've kind of focused those things down. So uh, we can either look at resources and technology or land use and ecosystems or water or waste and consumption. And we look at these things from, I think, a pretty holistic perspective. We talk about the science, yes, yes. We talk about cultural revolution and social justice. We talk about, um, like, we talk about these issues from a myriad of different perspectives and try to get a good sense of like, what is this place? How does this place work um, as it relates to one of those specific topics? Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I, you know, Auntie Paige basically shows up in a classroom and we're either going on a field trip or there's a guest speaker coming in or playing a game or we're like doing an engineering challenge or something like that. Um, so it's really focusing on making this like an optimistic uh, endeavor, you know, a, a, like a, the pursuit of knowledge and information in this place from a fun, interesting, dynamic perspective. That's the idea. Um, and it works so well that I, I thought, hey, you know who might enjoy this? grownups. Uh, and so we kind of took this natural leaders project format and adapted it to be a professional development opportunity for city of Lethbridge employees, um, which has been fascinating. Uh, so we get like a group of people from all different areas of the city, you know, people in urban design, urban planning, people from waterworks, uh, people from accounting, like a, a myriad of different professional adults who serve this city and this place. And we get them in a room down at the nature center. Uh, we take them out on long walks. We go, we explore kind of the fundamental aspects of this place from an ecological perspective. And then we ask them to take something they've learned back to their workplace. Um, and we've seen some really cool initiatives come out of uh, it from that uh, particular program. And moving forward into the future, I'm really excited at the prospect of how can we apply this approach to professional development um, at other businesses and other organizations around town. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. Um, it's a lot of fun. That's the kind of emphasis and the focus. Uh, we also spend a lot of time outside. Uh, that's a, a really important thing as well. But anyway, uh, so I'll like narrow this down a little bit. Uh, and let's like kind of look at maybe cli the climate change uh, filter here. This makes sense. This is all about climate change. 
Uh, so all my classes learn about climate change. All of my class classes learn about and we discuss um, this place as Blackfoot territory. All of my classes look at and discuss, you know, uh, their homes and like how our learning applies to like their house or their home. Um, so uh, in terms of climate change, uh, we talk about the science, you know, what it is, how it works, <laughs> what's going on. Uh, and I will say, in the five years that I've been doing this, we should all be very pleased to know that the level of knowledge that the young people have about climate change these days has like whoosh, skyrocketed in just five years, which speaks to leadership and how important leadership is. And I think maybe, you know, just the fact that our global leaders have acknowledged that it's real has had a huge impact and it's like trickled into the minds of these young people. Um, so when it comes to climate change, that is a pretty heavy topic uh, to talk about with kids. We talk about the science, we talk about what it is, we talk about how serious it is. Um, but what I'd like to talk to you guys about today is <laughs> the solution that I've come up with. Uh, the solution to climate change, you're welcome. Uh, basically, uh, the solution that we have and that I bring into this, the classrooms and that we discuss is daydreaming. Yes, daydreaming. Daydreaming as the solution to this big old conundrum, the climate change issue. Um, and so kind of one of the first things that I ask kids to do and adults who are participating as well is to visualize, to daydream up the future you want. And like, don't commit the cardinal sin of being realistic. Like daydream the world that you want to see, you know, when you're a grown up, as I say to these kids, you know, even 20 or 30 years from now, what do you want this world to look like? What do you want your house to look like? What kind of city do you want to live in? What do you want the natural spaces that you enjoy and that you camp in and that you get to explore and hike? And what do you want them to look like? What do you want this world to be? So let's get into the juicy brain, like daydream of it all. Um, and we spend a lot of time in like fanciful daydream land and there's no limit. You know, you want to talk Star Wars, let's talk Star Wars. You know, you want to bring in uh, kind of like the futuristic crazy Sims world, although the kids aren't playing Sims, what are they playing? Minecraft or whatever. Um, you know, like let's talk about all of these cool, awesome, amazing daydreams that you have for the future and for the like solution, uh, the the kind of new, innovative, fun, interesting, entertaining uh, world that you want to live in. So it's really about that. And then, because I can't help myself, educator page basically then asks them to tie in the kind of nature content that they know I'm here for. Um, so when it comes to climate change, okay, in this amazing, cool, futuristic, awesome world, where is your energy source? What is your energy source or sources, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any chance we're gonna use less energy. So I don't even focus on this idea of talking about reducing energy consumption. Um, the idea is, okay, what, what, what kind of energy do you want to have available to you that is maybe free to you, um, that doesn't cost you anything or that is unlimited? Um, this is where kyber crystals and like lightsabers come into play a lot of the time. The idea is like, okay, let's talk about energy and where you want it to come from. So as part of this in the backstory of learning, we obviously talk about wind turbines. I take them to the college, to the turbine facility, to like strap them in a harness and like, you know, get them to explore like all of the facets of being a turbine technician. Or we go to the aquaculture center or geothermal. We talk about bio, like the Lethbridge biogas plant, solar energy. We learn about these things and then see how they apply in the context of this imaginary daydream world that we're creating. Um, other cool things that we do uh, when we're looking at like the urban ecosystem, which I focus a lot on the urban ecosystem, not only, but a lot of our time we spend daydreaming uh, and learning about the actual urban ecosystem. Um, we look at like green cities and all of these like cool futuristic new images you're seeing of like buildings covered in plants and you know uh, all of the like cool innovative ways uh, efficient ways of like getting around a city what do you want parks to look like you know hey kids how do you actually want to get to school is there a way other than a bus or your parents car like what do you actually want to see um, and in the process of daydreaming these cool things we talk about okay 
what are the re what's the reality here so if you want a house covered in plants with plants on the roofs what can you a 12 year old do right now to achieve that you can just like you know go out and pick up a vine plant and try to grow one vine that crawls up your house you know i had one student recently who said i want to live in a tree house it's like great that's awesome that sounds excellent what's the first thing you need to do you got to plant a tree that's the first thing you need you need to put a tree in your yard and then one day it'll be big enough you can build it and like turn it into a tree fort um so looking at how to create this plant paradise um, that they see in all these Google images I'm sharing with them, um, and to realize, holy cow, all of this stuff is already available. Like the, the amazing thing about these daydreams is that so much of what we're daydreaming actually already exists. It's just that we're not implementing it um, in, any, in any like noticeable way all at once. And the cool thing about living in this wild and crazy day and age, in, this, in the age of COVID, is that we've managed to stop a moving train, which is incredible. So how do we now kind of move forward from this very special moment in time? Um, so the idea behind the daydream um, is really about asking students, okay, visualize what you want. Don't base this on what already exists necessarily. Um, and let's find useful, tangible ways to actually bring that into fruition. And a lot, one thing that I like to talk about a lot is basically this idea that, you know, at the turn of the 20th century, a bunch of nerds writing about science fiction captured the imagination of an entire generation. And 60 years later, you have a space program. So daydreams really are what push us forward. And I think it's really cool um, to, to recognize the power of a daydream and that visualization and to see how that goes. So my challenge for you, I suppose, after all this rambling, is uh, I challenge you to, to daydream. Daydream tonight after this session, tomorrow when you're supposed to be working or whatever, spend some time to start to visualize what you wanna see. And then a step back, assess this amazing, cool, awesome, perfect future utopia and figure out what you can do right now to start moving in that direction. So even though what we're doing in terms of climate change uh, work in the Natural Leaders Project isn't necessarily always super tangible, it's definitely moving us forward. Um, so, you know, as part of this program, we obviously we plant a lot. Uh, we do a lot of like um, cleanup and stewardship programs. The kids do lots of engineering design and like design challenges, trying to figure out ways to like riddle out and solve all these problems that we come up with. But really at the core of it all is daydreaming and you never too old to daydream. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That's, that's that. Thanks Paige. Your positivity is infectious and your program sounds awesome. And I really want to come out with you. <laughs> it's super awesome. Anytime you just email me if this, and this applies to anybody, if you want to know what we're doing, or if you want to like join me one day, I mean, obviously I'm not in schools right now, but next year, <laughs> back in those schools, try and stop us. Uh, yeah. So anytime, just contact me page.rosener at leftbridge.ca. If you have any questions, if you have any hopes or dreams, you just let me know. I'm here for it. And I'd like to hear about what other people are doing. Because one of the most important things I do is find all these little treasures out in the community stuff that's happening and like drag it into the classroom and teach, teach all these people about it. So thanks. Thanks for your time. Thanks for letting me uh, share my piece. Thanks, Paige. So we do, Jim, I can see Jim Byrne has his hand raised. So Jim, I'm going to unmute you. I'm assuming you have it. Oh, <laughs> it is unraised. <laughs> Um, okay, I will not unmute you then, uh, Dr. Byrne. Okay, uh, we will move on to the next speaker then. So our final speaker before the panel discussion is Sabrina Ryans, and she's with CPAW Southern Alberta. Uh, Sabrina is passionate about helping youth and adults get outside and connect with their local landscape. She considers herself blessed to have been able to spend the last 15 years getting to do exactly that throughout Central and Southern Alberta. Sabrina holds a Bachelor of Applied Ecotourism and Outdoor Leadership and is an instructor with Outdoor Council of Canada and Paddle Canada. So Sabrina, I'll let you take it from here. I think you're sharing your screen for your presentation, right? 
Yeah, I am. So I'll just uh, swap to my screen share and I'll take over. So hi, everyone. Uh, as Brooke said, my name is Sabrina Ryans and I am actually really pumped to be part of this panel. I am, uh, yeah, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm also a proud member of CPAS Southern Alberta's award-winning ed team. Uh, and like my introduction said, I get to play outside with kids. So much like Paige, I get to spend a lot of time with kids in wilderness spaces and natural spaces, which is awesome. Uh, and yeah, it's just wonderful to be here with you tonight, uh, just sharing and just a ton of hope and promise uh, for local climate change solutions because um, there is a lot of hope and promise. Uh, and I've just brought some evidence from our end at uh, the CPAWS ed team. So provided my system works. There it is. Um, so yeah, I just want to share with you uh, just one of my favorite flowers, which I think really perfectly illustrates just the strength and resiliency of our region uh, down in southwest Alberta. Um, it's just, it's one of the first out of the ground, and yet it just is a surprising offering of beauty, which I think uh, hits on a lot of the points I've heard here tonight. Uh, yeah, I just can hardly imagine a better image to represent us uh, as we discuss and share ideas and continue exploring climate solutions, promise, and possibilities uh, here in the Lethbridge area. And just so folks know, I'm actually out in Pincher Creek, so uh, I'm a little bit further west than everyone else. Um, so because there's just virtually hundreds of thousands of solutions here in Southern Alberta alone, and as promised, here they are. So there's, they're living, they're learning, and they're smiling. So of course the climate solution I promised to referring to is, yeah, I swear I heard it all the way through Zoom. Um, and I want you to share it. So I want to know what you think. So leaning into my love of inquiry-based environmental ed, I'd like to engage your insights and imagination and see what climate promises you see here. Um, so if you'll just follow me over to menti.com. So you can either log in uh, on another browser on your computer or you can scan the QR code that you can see and either one of those things will bring you to Menti and you can enter the code there and this will let us interact a little bit more than just the chat. So I'll just give you a second to do that. So what climate solution do you see in the images that I shared earlier? So you can just take a second again, just at menti.com. Uh, you can use the code that's at the top of the screen and you can actually just type in your answers and it should start to show up. Okay, so I see four people logged in. I'll give a, people a few more minutes or a few more seconds to do that. There we go. So yeah, we're seeing respecting nature, uh, education, learning, youth, I love it. Um, connection. See that a couple spaces. Collaboration, resilience, connection with nature. Awesome, I'll just give everyone maybe one more, another second or two to, to do that. Cool, a couple more things in there. Fun, of course it is, because you're playing outside. Uh, anytime you're outside is more fun than in Inside, I think we've all learned that this year. Um, sure, sweet. 
Okay, I'm going to head back to the, the presentation. Perfect. So, So I think you will, everyone pretty much hit it on the head. Uh, without a doubt, when it comes to naming what we consider to be the most promising climate solution in the Lethbridge region, uh, we at CPAWS Education know that it is nature connection. And that's nature connection by everyone for everyone. So why are we so sure that nature connection holds the most promise here? Well, for starters, at CPAWS, we believe that nature knows best on just about everything, including climate change solutions. So as Canada's only nationwide environmental nonprofit uh, dedicated slow, solely to the protection of our public land and water and ensuring our parks and wilderness spaces are managed to protect ecosystems within them, CPAWS believes that nature is in fact the climate game changer. For instance, as other people have alluded to, uh, native grasslands are enormous carbon captures. Uh, like trees, uh, grasses exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide, and worldwide they contain over 50% of the world's organic carbon. Um, and as you probably already know, carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse grass driving climate change. Uh, but when it's stored within the earth, like when it's incorporated into our grasslands, its soil or trees, it's locked away from becoming CO2 gas. And with the warming planet on our hands, the wild space's ability to sequester and store massive amounts of organic carbon might just be that leg up we need to secure the carbon neutral new world order. So leaving intact our natural ecosystems to do what they do best can bring a huge climate impact. So in other words, when we harness the power of natural ecosystems to combat climate change, we give rise to the great potential of nature-based climate solutions. And the potential of nature-based climate solutions is huge. So science, uh, scientists estimate that global nature-based climate solutions can provide over one third of the climate mitigation needed between now and 2030 to help stabilize our global warming uh, at the level recommended by international climate experts. Um, and you thought there was no way that you could love nature any more than you already do. Well, there always is. And that's precisely the point, nature connection. Um, so nature connection is contagious, it's inclusive, it's fun, it's authentic. And in the end, uh, in the words of Abadam, we'll conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, we will understand only what we are taught. So do you want to say thank you for everyone's time? I don't want to take up a ton of everyone's time and let them kind of keep doing and we can hopefully get to the panel discussion, but we do want to share a couple of the ways that uh, people can take part at home. So things like Bring Nature Home, there's a ton of resources on there uh, to take part in nature exploration just from your home and as well as the CPA Action Challenge, which is a way to get uh, involved and earn some points and work towards uh, winning prizes within the community. I will uh, give control back to uh, the rest of the team and then we can carry on from there. Thanks, Sabrina. So, oh, we have a question in the Q&A for you. Um, it says, are there resources available for native species? If you wanna hold that, we can wait until the panel discussion or if you have a quick answer and you wanna answer it now, that's cool too. I think the short answer is yes, and I think it probably depends on what, what species you're looking for and where. Um, I think there's also some panelists that probably have some pretty good answers to that as well, so. Okay. Great, so we will transition into the panel discussion now. And I wanna make sure that the audience feels like you are included in this conversation. Um, I know how exhausting it is to sit on Zoom all day and then give your time to another Zoom webinar in the evening. Uh, so first of all, thank you all so much for attending tonight. So we do have a question for the audience and it is, we're gonna throw it back to you and we're gonna ask you, what do you think is the most promising climate solution in Southern Alberta? So we're gonna do a one more mentee and Sabrina is gonna share her screen again for that. 
Um, and then that'll lead us into our panel discussion. Same thing, you can head back over to Menti and uh, pop into that. Thanks, Sabrina. And it's the same one, right? Yeah, it's the same. Okay. It's a tough question and we've had so many great presentations should fuel your inspiration for the answer to this question. So if you're on Menti, I just noticed I'm on it on my phone. If you hit next question, it'll take you to this one. Okay, there we go. We've got one person in now. So what do you see as being the most promising climate solution? Nappy's garden, communal work, regenerative egg. Political action. working together, small actions every day. Well, these are great. There's such a diversity in responses on this word cloud. This is amazing. So we, we I think, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm speaking out of turn here, but I think we can export the word cloud when it's finished and we can share it with everybody afterwards too. So we can, Sabrina's nodding, okay. <laughs> Um, awesome. Thanks, everyone. So we've got about 12 responses. We can switch back to the panel discussion now, Sabrina, if you want to. Thanks. Okay, we've got lots of questions coming in the Q&A. Um, thank you all to all the panelists for your presentations. They were so great. I, I love the, the diversity of voices that we have on this panel and the different perspectives that everyone comes from. This is this is awesome. <laughs> okay, so we'll just jump right into it. Do we want to, did anybody else want to speak to resources available for native species? Oh, I know that here in town, here in Lethbridge, uh, we have tons of resources at the Nature Center. Of course, building's closed right now, but we'll be, <laughs> but we'll be open soon. Um, also, I mean, I'm sure um, Running Coyote can speak to this in a more significant way than I can, uh, but the Galt also has some pretty uh, good seeds actually available. Um, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities to ask questions directly to, for example, the Helen Children Nature Center over Facebook. You contact us through the magic of the internet. Um, specific questions can be answered, and we can actually guide you towards like PDFs, um, uh, uh, like video uh, documents that we have. We are a library to share all of that information. So, for sure, the Nature Center anytime, anytime. Anytime except physically right now. <laughs> Thanks, Paige. I mean, if you don't uh, hear loud enough, somebody will answer it. I'm not yeah. <laughs> building, so. Did anybody else want to speak to that question? Uh, yes. Yeah, in terms of um, resources, we're actually working on a lot of that, like I mentioned in my presentation. Uh, this is actually um, my third year in collecting seed and the first year of Nappi's Garden. And this is also the first year that the tribe is um, becoming involved. So we're working on a lot of that. And we're also going to be uh, looking towards like uh, Helen Schuler and the Galt because um, we got some of our, you know, early seeds from the Galt, you know, they were gifted to me. And that was something that I wanted to, you know, uh, also work with um, our, you know, they're, they're, we work together. So, and like I said, we will have uh, some information regarding that because a lot of our community are also wanting to uh, invest their time in growing like native seed. Uh, but in the meantime, what we're doing is a lot of it is uh, focused on research, but eventually within probably hopefully in the next year, we'll have uh, uh, more seeds and resources available uh, to the wider community. Awesome, thank you. Sheldon, Catherine, did you guys want to speak to that? Okay, we can move on to the next question. Um, so this is more of a statement than a question, but it says, 
I really think that wind energy is the way to go, but the scary crashes scare me for those living nearby. This is, I knew wind was gonna come up in the Lethbridge area. How did I see that coming? <laughs> um, does someone else wanna, wanna speak to that, to wind power? I have, oh, I do have one thing to say. <laughs> I'm gonna have lots to say. Well, I'm sure that's not surprising anyway. Um, one thing I will say, I, I don't know that there's ever one solution to anything. Um, and what I talk about a lot is strategic uh, resources for certain jobs. Sometimes wind is the solution. Sometimes solar is, sometimes geothermal is. And like the big pickle we got ourselves in last time was focusing on one thing and just assuming that's gonna take us to the top, right? Um, so I think this idea of like sh spreading it out, smearing across tons of different opportunities and knowing which tool works. When are solar panels on the roof of your house the solution? When is a residential geothermal solution the best thing for you? When is, you know, uh, like a decentralized system, when is, that, when is that the solution to this problem? So I think the beauty of that is that it creates tons of jobs and it creates like tons of resilience. Um, and it also like kind of creates that glorious little competitiveness that can actually lead to like greater innovation and better efficiency. So I think in my opinion, let's take them all, let's do all of it. You know, I mean, let's each pick our own thing and then work all together to create this like web. But anyway, wind is cool though, wind is cool. I think maybe to build on what Paige was saying is that one of the nice things about being able to switch up uh, different things is that not, you, you can put things in the right, the right place and at the right amount too, um, to, to limit the potentially the downsides of any technology. So any technology is not going to work as well or could have a risk to it or uh, can have an environmental impact in one way or another. So as we move forward, I think looking at that holistic solution allows us to, and, and being strategic allows us to help waylay the, either the fears or the concerns. I mean, uh, locally, one of our concerns is trying to balance the installation of wind and wind turbines with the protection of our of our native grasslands and our fescue grasses. Um, and, and how do we recover that once we start putting wind and roads in uh, to be able to access and maintain those turbines. And so uh, one of the solutions was to put it in near the sewage lagoon. Uh, what a great way to, you know, it, it's land that's not going to be used for much else anyway. Um, and it's a, a great spot for it. So and already disturbed lands. I might just add to that, Sabrina, like you touch on an ecological principle, right, of layering things and pages point, let's have it all, <laughs> is a little bit like an ecological principle of diversity, right, where there's niches and layers and ways of synergizing these things so that if you were to couple a wind project with a solar project, you might be able to use lower quality wind resources because you've got infrastructure there for the solar project and program, right? And the roads, whether it's for a sewage plant <laughs> or for a whatever it is, or when you're reclaiming your mine, maybe you think ahead and you say, hey, let's put some access infrastructure in there that might include trails for people that want to recreate and don't want to have to go into the park system that's further and takes more fossil fuel to get to, or let's do these things that create these added values at low costs, right? And if you even think about, you know, the, um, the biomimicry concept of that one little diagram I showed of the panels with tree, with cows grazing underneath, there is wind turbines that are vertical structures that generate power because they wiggle, right? And every tree I have out there on the pasture has this type of functionality to it, but those rigid solar panels don't take care advantage of that. They sit there and try to resist that natural energy that's already there. All you gotta do is build in the functionality and you can have both, right? So you guys are definitely, in my mind, right on the right page of saying, Let's mimic nature, let's follow nature. And, you know, William, running Kyle, however you want to be referred to, you really touch some chords with me with the way that you're doing that and stuff. 
Oh yeah, thanks, Sheldon. And one of the interesting things that we're also looking at is with uh, um, how we're going to power Napi's garden. So we're looking at different ways, like um, with solar or even uh, wind. And also uh, on the northern part of the reserve, it's a lot of really sensitive habitat, and and it's dotted with uh, oil wells, and a lot of them are going to be decommissioned. So yeah. we're looking at ways to utilize that land either with um, uh, wind power or solar. But also with in that particular area is really sensitive. Like I said, there's a lot of birds that uh, live in that area. So you know the decision. You know there's decisions that we have to make on that because uh, you know uh, there's just a lot of uh, possibilities. You know like through geothermal, you know all, all of that. So and that's something that you know we're looking at. You know get rid of those unsightly wind. You know those oil wells and replace it with some energy. Thank you all said it wonderfully. I'll, I'll just like echo like definitely uh, diversifying how we generate energy is essential. Uh, we, uh, I say we, but I don't even know who I'm referring to. People in general love to put a one, like one stamp solution. They put it on everything. It's supposed to work, but that's not how it works. Biodiversity is a thing because every ecosystem has its niche and every uh, organism that lives in that niche has a very specific function and we need to mirror that um, and how we generate power and deal with uh, climate change by acknowledging what's already happening and how we can adapt to it and be resilient rather than trying to a uh, one size fits all. And um, just to touch on something that I was talking about, about linking uh, solar and wind power with BC Hydro. BC Hydro right now, as it sits, is very uh, minimal ecological impact, but starting a new one has a pretty high carbon footprint of getting it set up. And also uh, heavy usages impact the downstream ecosystems by constant flooding and, and um, I'm drawing a blank on what the opposite of flooding is, but that. Um, so it has its disadvantages just as much as it has its advantages. So by pairing these systems with more economic, or, yeah, environmentally friendly systems, we are able to diversify our power production and therefore minimize our impact while also not being too rigid in how we consider power. So. Thanks, Catherine. So our next question is, uh, are there ways to coordinate individual efforts with community, government, or municipal efforts to take significant steps forward together? So how can we coordinate with different levels of government? Oh man, that's a heavy question. <laughs> man, how do you like strap seven trains together and get them to go in one direction? That's a wild ride. Um, I think that's a great question. From my perspective, <laughs> working within the glorious, you know, cogs of bureaucracy, I have found the best thing that that works for me and my work is like to just do it anyway. And then slowly over time, as you kind of branch out and form new relationships, and that's really what it is about getting to know people in different um at these different levels of government who you can actually like phone and talk to human human people. Um, and then kind of learning first what we're all doing and trying to figure out ways to make these connections. But I try not to wait too long for a connection before I can just start doing. I just start doing. I think that is the best thing that you can do. And chances are, if you're doing something awesome, tell your municipal government about it because they will want to get their picture taken next to it. And for good reason, right? Um, and that's how these things happen. I think a lot of times people are apprehensive to reach out and talk to, especially municipal leaders, because they're a little closer to the situation. Um, and it's not as, um, I think it's easier for them to get involved and to get involved in a meaningful way. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out respectfully, you know, to local leaders and not just politicians, but there are so many other people who actually create the policy that gets put on the desk of a politician who then signs, signs off on it. Um, so finding the people who are actually doing things in your community, I think is one of the best things you can do and just do it yourself. I think to, to build on pages, it's that, that continuously uh, getting to, uh, getting to know and your municipal leaders 
And especially I think uh, in my context where it's where your rule, it's even easier to get to know them and to show them uh, the project that you're doing. And then also just keeping an eye on what's going on in your community and in your area. I think oftentimes we only pay attention to politics when something bad is happening. Um, and we promote uh, fighting, maybe arguing against it as opposed to finding the things that are going really well and, and supporting those things as well. And that gives you a lot of the social license that and relationship building that Paige was talking about in order to build that relationship. So when you want to impact change, um, you have that relationship with those and especially the municipal, um, that municipal level, they are the ones that are then gonna push and advocate up the chain uh, to get uh, people on board as they need to. Um, you'll get a lot more push from a municipal councillor going to an MLA uh, than a private citizen going to an MLA. Not saying it's ineffective, but it's more effective when they're, they have that relationship as well. One of the uh, interesting things here, uh, living on a reserve is uh, um, getting our chief and council on board and, and to have that understanding of the, the work that needs to be done. So for a number of years, I've been uh, wanting to have our chief and councils, even the previous ones, to take a look into the state of the reserve and to also look at uh, other communities and what they're doing in areas of uh, like uh, in, uh, energy. So with, what, what, um, with this current chief and council, I'd say about 40% of, the, of them are actually in favor of a lot of the things that we're doing. And one thing I had, you know, I, uh, I believe, you know, what Paige was saying is that you, you just have to do it. Uh, and that was something that I realized, uh, you know, like uh, I was I was telling our leadership, community members and elders about the, the issues that we're facing with the decline of our plants. So what ended up happening is, as well, since you know all of it, you do it, you take care of it. So so with that, you know, I, I've managed to get our chief on board. Because uh, the thing with our chief, uh, his, his name is Roy Fox. He, util he uses uh, and relies on a lot of our traditional uh, plants for medicine. And when uh, he also calls on me a lot to supply him with them. But I had mentioned to him that uh, there's a decline in these plants. I told him, what, so what are you going to do when I can't give you these plants you're asking about? So that really made him think. So in, the, in, in one of the slides, you saw one of our blood tribe counselors actually taking part. And that's what's what I've always wanted them to be a part of. And that's where like we can get things started because one of the issues that we face is that uh, and when it comes to uh, energy, a lot of times we're kind of told what to select, you know, what to choose. And uh, like wind was something that our, our council is really kind of looking at towards, but also like other areas like geothermal and solar. So with us, it's really, you know, on the reserve, it's, it's almost like we're in a different country. We need to sort of tackle our our leadership and then further then they can start looking at outside the outside leadership, our MPs and our MLAs. So with that, you know, it, there's hope, you know, with, with the work that we're doing is that at, at some point we'll be able to, uh, you know, just get on board with everyone else because we seem to lag behind on a lot of things, but it goes back to the saying is that you just gotta do it. And that's where uh, I'm in the position today you know, to help um, not only my community, but be a part of the solution, uh, you know, for the overall community. Thank you. I might I'll just, oh, oh, no, go sorry. ahead. Oh, I was just gonna quickly add, um, and uh, what, one thing, especially about appealing to municipal governments as I have found at least in my limited experience that, um, making environmental issues about more than environment is important. I feel like I need a shower every time I make an environmental issue economic, but I can tie it into economics. I can tie it into social issues. I can tie it into a host of different issues that are very human and not just you know words on paper and making those um, need, that need, that need for action as a very personal, like this is my contribution to my community rather than a, oh, here's a spreadsheet about you know carbon emissions that's hard to grasp. Making it a very human experience brings it home and makes people feel like they need to act. Um, and I do find that there is a lot of room at that, with that at the municipal level, um, for instance, the Lethbridge um, Municipal Development Plan was recently released, I believe last month, and there was a lot of good language in there about um, local climate action, and there were councillors actually calling for stronger language, so it was very like an encouraging experience to see local government very, um, wanting very much to advance our um, green initiatives in the city, and um, yeah, there's a lot of more room for that, and especially with municipal elections coming up, um, it's a good thing to consider who are our allies and uh, to find those allies. 
Yes, absolutely. I totally agree uh, in terms of trying to frame whatever you're doing through um, multiple lenses um, and not just kind of, people don't do things for bunnies. <laughs> I don't know what it's all about. They need some other reasons. Anyway, um, the other thing I was going to say just to add to that is in terms of like, I talked about connecting with people and like going out and forming those relationships. I, <laughs> if I could have told, you know, Paige 10 years ago, like just contact people. You don't have to know them. They don't have to know who you are. Just bug them email them, tell them who you are and what you're doing. I love getting those emails. And sometimes I, like often I can't do anything about it, but it's like, hmm, you know, who actually could talk to this person, this person. So I'll forward that on. So making those connections cold, like cold calling or cold emailing, I think is a, works a little bit better sometimes. Um, starting those relationships from nothing uh, can be hugely, it's not as terrifying as it seems. And I, it can be hugely beneficial as well. I guess I'd just like to add one more thing here, and that's an ecological principle around energy transfer and utilization and healthy systems. If you want a system that is going to be vibrant and grow and proliferate, you want it to be a system <laughs> that provides benefits that vastly exceed the costs of the system, right? And so I'd like to submit that people recognize that economics is not something to go take a shower when somebody brings it up. It's to realize that if we can tip the scales and make it more profitable for people to do conservation-based practices and help them realize that it's in their financial best interest, not punitively, but ecologically, to support the health and vibrancy of those fundamental systems, right? To work with nature and create more value outside, more value for themselves, value for people that want to view the properties, the whatever, right? Participate in whatever way the more that society can participate in rewarding the production of the things that we want, reward sequestration of carbon, people will jump on board and for their own selfish interests, they'll thrive on it and they'll love it. And they don't have to necessarily share our moral values about what is right or how much carbon we would like to put in the soil or what it takes to balance nature. They're just gonna do it in their own self-interest just like every creature out there is trying to feed itself and its babies <laughs> and make its own system work, right? It's trying to fit into the ecological processes and incentives that affect us all. And finances and human currency transactions are just an analog of the same thing we see in protein, energy, sunlight, carbon, and all of the natural processes. Thanks, Sheldon. Thanks, everyone. We are, I'm gonna move us on to the next question because we were at 10 minutes. I could, I could keep this panel discussion going all night. We could go until midnight if you guys want. <laughs> Catherine's like, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here at nine. <laughs> um, okay, so this next question is, it's a big question. It's about overconsumption. So I'm just going to read it out to you guys because it is quite long. So it says overconsumption is arguably the biggest obstacle when it comes to seriously tackling the causes of climate change. And unfortunately, our present economy pretty much depends on more of the same. Even replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy, it's going to be a massive task to improve the dilemma we're in. Thoughts on that? I have lots of thoughts on that. <laughs> How much time do you have? Because I'm a women and gender studies major and we're about to talk about capitalism. <laughs> but yes, overconsumption is a big issue. Um, and especially because of there is such a, ma I wanna say massive, but there is a financial um, investment required to start the transition to renewable energy. And it's not just the switching to renewable, uh, switching to renewable energy, it's also the updating of our power systems and our equipment, essentially, the things that generate our hot, air, cold air, et cetera, 
to make them energy efficient. So it is a big investment. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we really need to have a serious conversation of what's more important than our ability to exist on this planet and not have it burn out in five years, or that we have, you know, billionaires that are making large sums of money and that we are incentivizing um, the kind of growing wealth inequality in multiple countries. So I, I think it comes down to we really need to reassess our priorities and there's going to be a bit of a lifestyle shift. Um, I don't think it needs to be as drastic as it gets fear mongering a little bit, but there does need to be an understanding that we all have to do our part and it's not just the responsibility of change. It's I think your internet is cutting out. Oh. Are you still there? Uh, yep, sorry. <laughs> My connection <laughs> is not the greatest. Um, but just to wrap up what I was saying, um, it, it's going to take a, a, a group effort of everyone to acknowledge that we all inhabit the same planet and all have the same stewardship responsibility and um, ignoring the problem doesn't make it any better. And that's all I'll say. Anybody else want to? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I like what Sheldon was talking about earlier, just in terms of like, how do we manage our inputs into a into a system and, and find that balance? I think when we look at, at overconsumption, it's often because we are in a biggering and biggering um, economic system and that we're willing to put in more inputs, but that's actually more costly. Um, so the ways that we choose to consume or not consume actually do have a um, an economic side to it or a cost to it. And I think, um, you know, going back to the previous question of meeting people where they're at in terms of uh, what overconsumption really looks like or where they can make changes. And I think Paige's idea of what do you want your world to look like? Um, that big daydream is a huge piece of that. Um, not just assuming that things will keep going the way they're going. Obviously that's not the case, but I think that positive outlook of how do we want it to look better and how do we reduce our inputs um, are a huge piece of, of that economic model. Anybody else want to speak to overconsumption? You're all nodding your heads. <laughs> I, I think that this is one of the most difficult things to discuss and talk about because it is, so much bigger than we can even wrap our heads around. Um, speaking to the pandemic and this particular fun little time we're in, like, I do think that it's interesting. I can't wait. I wish I could see 10 years from now, like what is actually happening? Because I think a lot is, a lot is happening right now. I think it's somewhat like a very exciting time to be alive, uh, all things told. Um, I as far as overconsumption is concerned, it's going to be interesting to look at how this pandemic changes where things are made and how we focus on that global supply chain and the, the kind of the chinks in that armor uh, that we're starting to see and realize and some of the local economic impacts of that. Um, so I don't have an answer to this question. Yes, overconsumption is like the big elephant in the room that is stomping all over everything cosmic dumping all over the floor. Um, and it is so much bigger than just kind of one solution. Where are things made? How do we understand and identify value? Where do we, like, how much free time do we have? And how does that impact the way that we consume objects and what kinds of things we consume? Um, it's a big question. I don't have an answer. I just wanted to say, like, I when you figure it out, let me know, because this is a big one. Okay, I'm just looking at the time and I really want to end on a positive note and not talking about <laughs> depressing overconsumption issues. So I'm just going to move on to the next and final question for the evening. And it says, what are everyone's favorite aspects of climate solutions or what do you find most enjoyable? And as Paige would put it, what are your deep daydreams for climate solutions? Do you want to start, Paige, since you brought up the daydreaming? I, I think it, there's so much, oh my gosh, there's so much to think about. Um, but I think the idea of solving the climate problem is so exciting because when we can figure out a way to activate a, uh, the ability to control and manipulate our climate, 
that has huge implications for this world that we live in and some of the um, other problems that we can solve around this planet, including things like extreme drought in certain regions, um, extreme weather. I, this is all, it sounds all very sci-fi, but like, honest to goodness, I think that this understand, we're being forced to look at this climate issue and I can't wait to see how we figure our way out of this and how we can apply that technology to create um, in pages, hopes and dreams, greater global equality, social justice, this idea that we are not creating like ghettoizing regions of this planet. I'm very excited to see how, how that all turns out. I, I think my, my favorite part is the ability for climate issues to bring people together that you would never normally see in a room. Um, some of the folks that I meet with, like I, I would never meet them in a million years if I wasn't engaged in the work that I am. Um, and I think that it brings out the best in a lot of people and it makes people really start to reevaluate um, their lives and their their place in the on the land and on the on the planet that we live on. So I, I really think that it the just the power for these issues and the the passion behind addressing them. Um, and making them bigger than oneself is a, a positive part of a really negative situation. But yeah, I, I love seeing people come out of the woodwork being like, I want to get involved in this, how do I get involved? And unfortunately the pandemic did kind of make that a bit challenging because energy levels are a little bit low, but I am hopeful that we will get back on that horse soon and um, start marching forward again. One of the, uh, uh, I guess the solutions that we, we're using here on the reserve is that we're using our traditional stories uh, because in a, uh, in a lot of our traditional stories that involve Nafi, he created a lot of uh, climate change events in the old, old times. And that was why Katuyis had to, you know, to, to rectify a lot of the damage and the, the, the mistakes he'd done. So with that, it's just, it's creating all, uh, an awareness of our community because not only, you know, you know, like our climate is affected, but it, it, it affects the whole worldview that we that we live under. And it's also, it's like a new thing for us to, to understand and, and become those stewards of the land that, you know, that we all should be. And that's something that for me is to get the community involved by using our traditional stories, you know, and protocol. I think when I see kids smiling faces and feeling a sense of success and hope uh, rather than an overwhelming problem to solve. What about you, Sheldon? What is your daydream for the future? It's, I love linking the desired outcomes that people have, the things they care about or passionate about, whether it's open space, clean water, renewable energy, carbon in the soils, out of the atmosphere, those kind of things. With people who and want that, being able to communicate and participate in the change themselves. So people in high rises that are aware that their carbon footprint and their physical footprint is quite limited, but collectively adds up to a whole bunch to help underwrite the costs of some of these changes as Paige and everybody has talked, sometimes there's a cost to transition from one state of being to another state, right? You go through a trough and an adaptation phase. And what's fun is saying the world benefits from the transition to this type of system, from this type of system. This, you call it overconsumption, you call it whatever you want. But if the world benefits from that change, Let's talk about the mechanisms that get us from here to here and how we can have people that care help underwrite the cost of going through that change. Let's prove it's possible to get here and then share that with people. That's all I get jazzed about. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you all so much. Oh. <laughs> The Zoom awkwardness. <laughs> um, thank you everyone so much for participating in this panel tonight. And thank you to all of the audience members who asked all of the great questions and for giving us your time this evening as well. You are all so appreciated. Um, we have one more event this week. We're, we're talking about solutions in Medicine Hat tomorrow night. If anybody wants to join, 
you all know how to get to the registration because you registered for this. <laughs> um, and we will notify whoever wins the, the climate kit over email after tonight. So thank you, everyone. I know that everyone at home is clapping, so I'm going to clap too. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. Stay safe. Stay well.